Thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, 3D Printing Solutions That Make the Design Process Flow, brought to you by Object and Design World magazine. We would like to thank our presenters, Dave Kaiser from Griswold Controls and Bruce Bradshaw from Object for being here today. I'm Leslie Langnaw, Managing Editor, and I'll be your moderator. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. If you wish to tweet about this webinar at any time, go ahead and use the hashtag DWWebinar. Also, feel free to go ahead and submit your questions at the question box on the corner of your screen, the control panel that came up. We will ask these questions once Dave and Bruce have finished their presentations. Dave Kaiser grew up working in his father's machine shop, learning to weld, fabricate, program, and operate CNC machines. He graduated from California State University of Long Beach with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering, and he has been the Director of Engineering with Griswold Controls out of Irvine, California for 17 years. Griswold is a precision valve manufacturer for the HVAC industry. After Dave's presentation, Bruce Bradshaw of Object will give a quick presentation and help answer any questions you may have on Object systems. Bruce leads Object's marketing efforts in North America, and his experience has helped position Object as a leading 3D printer vendor in the additive manufacturing market. He brings more than 20 years' experience and knowledge and expertise in technology, marketing, and over-positioning for organizations such as Object. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the microphone to Dave. OK. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Leslie. Uh, for all of those uh, who are watching and listening along today, um, we uh, are welcome you here. And uh, for those of you contemplating investing in uh, 3D technology uh, for printing purposes, uh, I understand your position. Uh, about two years ago, uh, I was involved in evaluating this technology. I know how it can be difficult. Uh, hopefully today uh, I can help you with the next steps uh, towards uh, deciding on a technology that will make a difference in your business. Uh, today I want to help bridge any gaps uh, that would hold you back from benefiting uh, from what I consider uh, not only amazing but a very powerful tool. Um, features, functions, benefits. These are all key considerations when evaluating a product, uh, and certainly Object delivers this technology. Um, in addition to the product highlights, I hope to spark some ideas today uh, that will connect you to some practical uses for your company. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you a little introduction to who we are uh, as a company, Griswold Controls, as an ISO 9001 uh, manufacturer of hydronic control valves. Uh, we manufacture uh, a wide variety of products. Uh, <clears throat> we also have 50 years, over 50 years of experience. So we've gone through some uh, hurdles of how to grow our business and uh, looking at uh, ways to do that. Uh, one of those ways is uh, you know we are an innovator uh, of engineered valve products. We've combined features, functions, benefits into our products. And so these have been some of the key things that have brought us uh, a competitive edge in the marketplace. Uh, we constantly have to reinvent. Uh, that is a, a part of our DNA. That is who we are. Um, our, a little bit about our business. Uh, HVAC industry, uh, where you have heating and cooling of buildings, we essentially deliver uh, a correct amount of uh, heating and cooling water uh, to the buildings keep the occupants comfortable, um, which is a, a something we all need on hot uh, or uh, cold days. Uh, <clears throat> we also specialize in products uh, that do enable buildings to operate efficiently. Uh, this is one of the key uh, strengths that we have. It's one of the things we offer our customers. Um, is a product that not only has a feature function benefit, but it, it really does address their bottom line okay, when it comes to paying the bills every month. Uh, we provide flow control solutions. Uh, we also do some customized uh, products for customers who have unique situations where they're trying to control flow or temperature in a process. Um, it's 
you know, we've done projects for a good year where they're trying to cool tires and, and keep, uh, you know, keep the process uh, controlled. So we uh, have done a lot of different specialized things as well. Okay. So important to any company um, is, you know, what drives innovation. And for Griswold Controls, uh, we have a desire to improve building comfort and operational efficiency. Uh, this this is where our products impact the customer, and um, uh, we we take pride in that. Uh, we put a lot of our, our focus in that. Another thing is intellectual property. Uh, this is one of the things that can grow and secure uh, your business, uh, especially as you look at customers that uh, find a need in a product that you offer. Okay, um, we work on patents regularly to uh, capture the uh, IP that we, we uh, essentially take to our customers and uh, forges those relationships. Uh, we also leverage our competitive edge in the market. Okay? Uh, sometimes you know, just putting together a, a Me Too product um, has a lot of work and little reward. So we do try to differentiate ourselves with our products, what we offer. Um, and ultimately try to uh, address the, the customer's bottom line, uh, looking after them. Uh, reducing cost is, uh, is familiar to just about everyone. Uh, as we look at uh, that, it, it's a constant reminder that we're striving to improve, uh, like most companies. <clears throat> uh, within the product development crosshairs is often you know, everything that affects the bottom line. Um, we look at uh, developing uh, low-cost solutions that are, you know, designed that have feature-rich content, uh, higher performance, and of course the, the infamous one that uh, most bosses like to remind us that uh, they like the project done faster. Uh, I'm sure you've all uh, heard that and experienced it on a regular basis. And hopefully these things don't keep you up too late at night, but uh, they are a reality for anyone designing products. So we recognize that, and that's part of the solution that uh, Object provides. I want to take a little bit of time to talk about some key milestones, things that I've observed. Um, you probably have as well. Um, as we look at the evolution of technology, um, you know, sketching is still a great way to uh, efficiently communicate your ideas. So pencil drafting at the bottom is uh, uh, it's something that we still use today. Um, I was, you know, sketching for engineers, an idea, a concept, um, and uh, although my artwork isn't that great, it still serves a purpose. One of the things that um, probably first really changed the industry was a 2D flat file type of drawing uh, where you can save your images, you can make changes, you can rename files, you can create blocks and insert them and drag them, move them around. So the 2D evolution uh, was, a, was a huge step. Um, and it, uh, it saved the erasing on a, a drafting board, which uh, uh, everyone loved. Uh, it, it, it's huge. The next big step was uh, 3D, uh, where we added a, a dimension. But we also added uh, information like the density of the material, the mass, the volume. And other material properties, such as if the part is you know, made out of aluminum or, or steel, um, it, it allowed you to carry that information with the 3D file. Uh, th that information then uh, became uh, a next step to what we call finite element analysis, uh, which is used for the, the FEA is used for stress analysis in a part where you can apply a load and check to see how much the part deflects or if it breaks, um, the maximum stress involved. And then CFD, which is computational fluid dynamics, um, which looks at uh, how uh, fluids, gases or liquids, would move through valves. Um, so having the 3D model then enabled the software technology to evolve to a point where we can test products before we ever really build them. And at the top, of course, um, 
you know, along comes uh, 3D printing, which uh, rapid prototypes have completely changed the way we look at design engineering here at Griswold Controls, uh, the product development cycle, uh, and the tool is multifaceted. Uh, it has opened up doors, uh, uh, new opportunities to see to see the part, feel it, and, and even test your design uh, in a practical sense before you ever build one through traditional manufacturing processes. So this is the template for uh, what we've seen in the industry, and it uh, each step has been a significant contributor to the, the process, and it's changed the way we approach design. So we'll talk a little bit about the product development process uh, that we use here at Griswold Controls. You may find this familiar to some degree in your organization. Um, we start at the top with input. That input can be uh, anything from a customer who has an idea or a need, um, the sales team who spends time out in the field with the customer, uh, listening to them, bringing back ideas, uh, the marketing group, uh, and then you know just anyone in the company um, that has an idea for a new uh, a new widget. Uh, so we gather inputs. We then move towards concept models, and oftentimes this will start with, um, believe it or not, sketches, where we we put ideas down efficiently, and then we commit to a, a solid 3D model, uh, where we design things and we can print them out, uh, share them with uh, the rest of management. Uh, and the team uh, for consideration of you know all the things that how we're going to make it, what's going to look like, what's it going to do. So um, that's a preliminary phase. And then prototypes. Obviously, you can see here we're, we're this is where we want to test things. See that the uh, the inputs and the outputs match. Uh, we'll oftentimes do a cost evaluation to see whether uh, you know quotes come in and if this is a product where uh, the markets. Uh, desire matches the cost that we can produce it for. Um, and really, these two areas are where object really fits in nicely. Okay, um, the, This is where we can start to take the 3D model and have a part within the same day and be able to communicate to everyone, this is what's around the corner. This is what we're developing. Um, we then move on to production models. Uh, this is obviously where manufacturing uh, gets a, a hold of it, uh, the training that goes on. And sometimes we'll do pre-production release where you test the market, see how, how they like the product, and gather information and work with marketing on that. Uh, ultimately, the release of the product uh, involves a lot of steps for marketing sales and to launch that. Um, and then, of course, the, to complete the circle, there's always a uh, follow up to sales and marketing uh, to make sure that the customer's happy uh, that they they got what they uh, were expecting. So that cycle should be familiar to you all. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, we move into using object uh, software and, and technology. One of the things, uh, just a, a picture here on the left, is a solid model of a Venturi that we've we've designed. Um, in this case, it's a sales sample, so it's scaled down, and of course, we put it in a little plastic clear case so that it helps the salesman not only communicate the product, but what's unique about it, how it's differentiated in the marketplace. Okay, so we, we collaborate with our internal team. It's probably the first thing. Uh, it gives us the ability to to let uh, manufacturing know what's going on with the product, how it's built, how it goes together. Um, we can also share the design with our customers. This is another important thing because as you consider the customer's input, they like to have feedback um, that, uh, that you're on track, that uh, you've got some progress. This is a, an effective way of, of uh, communicating that uh, with them. You can also help your vendors understand your design intent. I had a project recently where, you know, we had the 3D model, and, and sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes printing out a part and mailing it to them uh, when they're doing, for instance, plastic injection uh, molded parts, and they're trying to design the tooling, um, they might be able to have a glimpse into things that 
it could be a problem at, at the early phase. So that really helps to uh, move that process along. And of course, you can equip yourself to, uh, to generate the market buzz and uh, gain new customers. So um, not just for engineering. Uh, the, the models play, uh, play a role in, in reaching the customer and letting everybody know uh, what, what your product is all about. Now we'll, we'll switch gears here just a little bit to the engineering side. One thing Griswold Control does is uh, uh, the fluid dynamic side. So the way we use the product um, is typically we design our 3D parts. We will use the CFD analysis, look at pressure drops, we'll look at velocities. The graph or the picture graph on the left shows you a velocity profile, um, red being fast and blue being low. Uh, and then on the right, you've got the pressure differential. So the red being the higher pressure and the greenish yellow being uh, the, the lower pressure. In this case, flow is moving from the right to the left. Uh, but for this, um, <clears throat> this tool allows us to check the performance characteristics. Okay, we want to study those characteristics through the valves. Um, it helps us to determine the valve capacity coefficient or the CV, which is um, not necessarily important uh, uh, to all of you, but it, it's something that we use consistently through our products. Um, we can also establish locations of maximum, minimum velocity and pressure. Um, helps us to steer away from problems that the valve might incur. Uh, and of course, reduction of cost. Uh, we can do stress tests and find out if the, the wall thickness is, is not uh, sufficient or, or maybe over-designed. There's a lot of things that we can glean from uh, the, the computational fluid dynamics. Now, one of the things that we have combined uh, is in our testing, uh, we have to validate, as an ISO 9000 company, we validate our, our tests on uh, functionality before ever building a uh, production part. We do it through the CFD on the left where you see the, the flow uh, velocity profiles. Uh, but then we also have the ability to take a model which we print out on the object printer and uh, literally connect it to real pipes and run water through it, measure pressure, measure flow with uh, equipment so that we can validate everything we test digitally. Um, this is uh, this is essential, um, and it's extremely valuable for reducing um, the time to get your product up and running. Uh, so fast tracking that intellectual property is also a benefit, um, especially with the way patent laws have changed. Um, now nowadays, you have to do what's called reduce your design to practice, or essentially show that your invention is, uh, uh, was built and tested rather than have some uh, perpetual motion machine that, that never could be built or never would work. So it, it is a, an assistance to, to you in that area as well. All right, um, concept apart. Uh, this is a picture of our machine. Uh, we have the Alaris 30, which produces um, uh, a layer resolution of, uh, I believe it's about 1.1 microns. And in perspective, that's about a, a quarter to a third the thickness of a piece of paper. So you get a really nice surface finish um, on these parts. Uh, we, when we take them out of the machine, uh, they're clean with a water jet. And um, then they're ready for printing, or excuse me, painting and uh, or testing. Uh, this machine has a printing envelope, uh, cubic volume of about 12 inches by 8 inches by 6 inches. Uh, covers a lot of parts that we do. Um, in some cases, we'll scale things down, which is fine. Uh, but uh, the parts are printed with two materials. Uh, one is the uh, soft gel-like material. It's called the support. Uh, that's the part that washes off. And then the model material, which makes the actual part. Okay, um, we typically use a material called barrel white, and uh, it has about 8,000 psi uh, pencil strength. Uh, works well. Um, we love 
the fact that the parts that come off our machine have good ductility. That means that they will flex. We evaluate a lot of the other technologies out there. And one of the things we did as a test is we would uh, put a screw into uh, like a hole feature. And some of the other parts would literally just shatter. Um, there was no yield. They didn't give at all. So we love that about this material because it's tough. Okay. Um, one of the things we do with these parts, sometimes we will pour a silicon mold around the parts that we make. Okay, and the reason for that is maybe we want to do a, a higher production run. So we will pour that, peel back the mold, take the uh, object part out, and then we can pour different materials. So it opens us up to a lot of, uh, a lot of flexibility. Um, if we want to make parts clear, so that people can see inside. We want to study um, how gas moves through a valve uh, with uh, colored gas or, or liquid. Uh, really opens up some, some opportunity. Now we saw probably about a payback of somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 months. Uh, we had a pretty good backlog of parts that need to be printed in different designs. And we, uh, we let the machine go. It's extremely reliable, um, simple to maintain. Uh, very easy to clean. There's not a lot involved. Uh, you use a little bit of uh, alcohol to uh, clean the, the heads. Um, and uh, another huge uh, benefit, we saw a lot of the technology administered the, the material in a single point fashion. By that I mean it's kind of like a hot glue gun where you go around and you just you know, put the material down and cure it as you go. Uh, it takes longer to do that. Uh, it also has some limitations, whereas the object technology literally lays down a sheet of material, almost like a spray can, but in a, in a linear fashion, and uh, then cures the material with the UV light, so it's very quick. By the uh, you know second or third pass, the material is cured at that layer and the machine just uh, continues on. So uh, very versatile. Uh, if we want to get parts, we can evaluate. OK, in summary, uh, the object technology uh, it effectively communicates design concepts. Whether it's your customers or your design team, your manufacturing team, it allows you to get your point across. Now, a picture's worth a 1,000 words, probably a 1,000 times that when you actually have a 3D part in your hand. Okay, it helps you to work out the manufacturing side of your designs. Uh, you can test form, fit, function of your design, see how they go together um, uh, long before you ever you know, make expensive prototypes that have a long lead time. You can efficiently validate your design performance, uh, and, and that has a, a lot of benefit for uh, going for patents as well as making sure you hit the mark. Uh, equipping your sales force with powerful selling tools, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's all about communicating. Uh, and these parts communicate to the engineers, the performance, to the salespeople, the featured benefits functions, as well as the customers uh, and your team uh, uh, that you, you have you know, daily you work with. So these are exciting technologies. Um, it, it's a pleasure to um, to be able to talk to you about these today, uh, I want to thank uh, the team at Object for, for giving me this opportunity uh, to, to share with you a little bit about how this technology can be used in your company. So with that, thank you very much. I'll go ahead and turn it over. Thank you, Dave, and uh, that was a wonderful presentation. And now we're going to hear from Bruce. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Dave, uh, very interesting presentation and, and very insightful for folks that uh, aren't familiar with 3D printing or if they are a different view and, and, and how it's used in the real world. We, we appreciate your, uh, your sharing that with us. Um, I'm going to only spend two or three slides uh, to talk a little bit about object, kind of what makes us different from others you may know. Um, and I'll try to go through these somewhat rapidly to preserve folks' time. But um, uh, object has a lot of different printers in our line, but one of the things that's um, 
key across all of ours, from our entry-level machine all the way to our most expensive machine, is the ability to print smooth surfaces and fine detail. So our printers print in very thin layers. Uh, David talked a little bit about how the printer functions. Um, so it prints in very thin layers that are uh, that build up the part layer by layer. And because of its accuracy in the, the layer thickness, you have the ability to do those functional tests that Dave referenced, the ability to, to use what we refer to as fit, form, and function applications because of the accuracy you get out of our, out of our printers. Um, on our high-end machines, the, the Conics, uh, we have uh, 17 base materials and 90 digital materials, making it 107 total materials available to someone for someone to use. Um, as you start to scale down on our material or our printer offerings, they vary in terms of uh, what materials you get, but the key is the quality is the same across all of the printers, regardless. Um, sorry here. Uh, just uh, I, I won't go into great detail of, of all these different companies, but it, it does highlight for folks um, the different industries that object users or our equipment can be found anywhere from medical device manufacturing to consumer goods like Fender guitars and whatnot, the industrial applications like Griswold, um, the sporting goods like Trek bicycles, the automotive manufacturers, BMW, uh, Audi, Ford, Chrysler are all customers of objects. So I won't spend a lot of time on that, but I'm sure there's a diverse audience of folks listening to the webinar, and I'm sure you can relate to one of these companies that, that uh, utilize our technology, and I'm sure it could be the same for you as well. Um, just a little bit about how our technology works. Um, it's based on inkjet technology, and that has a few advantages for, for uh, folks in the industry. One is uh, we leverage the industrial printheads that are used in wide format printers. So the, the folks like Canon and HP and Ricoh and Osei that develop this printhead technology are spending billions of dollars to push that technology forward. We're able to leverage it and bring it to the 3D printing space. So our R&D efforts can be spent on material development and doing things that allow our customers to better replicate their end product, as Dave pointed out, in the prototype stage. Um, one of the things that sets us apart on our high-end machine is the ability to print two materials at once. Um, and those two materials allow you to get as many as 14 different mechanical properties in the same part. So the only technology that allows you to do that, and again, as I said before, whether you're talking about the entry-level machines that we have all the way up to our most expensive machines, the inkjet head technology that's being used here is the, the key to it that allows folks to get um, the best quality regardless of the investment you make in your object machine. Um, some of the applications that can be used on our high-end machine are things like overmolding and soft touch. Um, so you can do things like living hinges. Um, you know, we've I've talked a lot to folks some of our customers, and they would always say that they felt a little bit uh, handcuffed when they would try to replicate or have designs um, that were trying to do a living hinge because they would use tape or something like that to uh, uh, to um, show their design. And because you can actually blend the materials and have a living hinge, they the, the comment was they actually feel liberated with their designs. They can communicate what they're trying to articulate to folks through the actual 3D model, and I think Dave referenced that as well. Um, we like to, to use a similar analogy to what Dave said, a picture's worth a thousand words and a prototype's worth a thousand pictures. So uh, I think he hit the nail on the head with that, and, and, and absolutely the different applications that, that you can use um, with 3D printers really extends that for you. Uh, just a brief overview of the printers. Again, we have three different categories in our printer line. One is the desktop family, and this is our entry-level machine starts at 19.9. Uh, uh, it's actually the printer that Dave uses. Uh, it's not, it, it, I think he's one step up in our desktop family and uh, has a little bit more functionality than uh, uh, what comes in the 19.9 model, but you heard the, the efficiencies and the productivity he gets out of it, and uh, it's um, a lot of people have a misconception that you need to go all the way to the most expensive, most uh, high-end machine in order to get efficiencies of 3D printing. And as you can hear from Dave, that's not the case. The desktop printers do a fantastic job and bring people 
leaps and bounds uh, ahead in their design process by, by adding a, a desktop 3D printer to their uh, repertoire. Um, last thing I'll just talk about is, um, again, we talked before about Objet's uh, goal of trying to allow customers to better replicate their final product before they go to manufacturing in the prototyping stage. And part of that is pushing the envelope of material development. And we introduced two materials that um, uh, I'd like to call to your attention. One is our clear transparency material called Vero Clear, um, which is available in our desktop model now, the Object 30 Pro, uh, allowing you to, to print uh, a lens if you're an automotive manufacturer or, or glasses in, in, if you're a sporting wear, sporting goods. Uh, manufacturer um, and to be able to be able to print a clear material in a machine uh, under fifty thousand dollars is, is unheard of these days so having that offering in our desktop line is is, is, uh, is pretty interesting we also have another material that we introduced recently called ABS like and it allows us to it uses the conix technology that's the conix uh, uh, technology I talked about by blending two materials and uh, it's unique because it takes two base materials, one that is high temperature materials, and most high temperature materials that are offered in a 3D printer typically have the trade-off of being very brittle. Um, and the second material that we use with it is a, a very tough material, and the tough materials typically in 3D printers tend to be very, uh, not high temperature, they're not very heat resistant. But because we're actually using the best of both worlds of those two materials, we end up with a very, very tough material that is very uh, high temperature resistant, so up to 95 degrees Celsius um, uh, after post curing. So it's a it's a it's a neat material that I just wanted to call to your attention. Uh, I think that's my last slide, Leslie. So I can okay. Back to you. All righty. Thank you very much, Bruce. Just a reminder to everyone: uh, feel free to start submitting in your questions. We already have a couple, so we're going to get going on that. But don't forget to just put in your questions uh, on the questions part of your screen there. So I think one of the first questions, which really ties in with what you were just saying, Bruce, is what is the difference between base material and digital material? Okay. So a base material is a material that is used out of a single cartridge. So it's it's one material. It's what Dave uses. He referenced he uses a Vero white material. It's one of our base materials. We have 17 of them. So we have a Vero black, a Vero gray, a Vero white, some rubber-like material called Tango. Those are all of our base materials. A digital material is actually taking two of those base materials and blending them together to get a different material, as I referenced before earlier, to get 14 different mechanical properties, or essentially 14 different materials in the same part. Um, if you are a bicycle manufacturer and you want to uh, do a small prototype of a bicycle, I can take a two of our base materials, a Vero White and a Tango Black Plus, and blend them together to get a seat that has one shore value the handlebar grips to be another shore value, the tire being completely rubber-like, the pedals being rigid but somewhat soft, the frame being very rigid, and the spokes being having some flexibility to absorb and the shocks being to absorb um, you know, the ride. All of those are different mechanical properties or different materials, and those are made up of digital materials. So that's really the difference, and it's actually taking a, in a very precise way laying down the dots of the different materials in a particular pattern or different uh, in a, in a uh, specific way developed by our engineers to get that mechanical property. So I have two materials laying side by side as well as a material on the top and a material on the bottom. Figure out which ones of those should go together to get the desired mechanical property is what makes digital materials the difference. Okay, another question is, um, is there a link where an engineer can get material specs to enter into SolidWorks for VeroClear and object ABS-like and any other object printing materials to allow for SolidWorks simulations? Um, there is, actually. We do have a software download that's available. And if you go to our, our website, 
you can um, uh, download a uh, an add-on to Object Studio that allows you to plug those different things in. So if you're not the person actually, um, uh, you don't own the printer yourself and you're sending it to a service bureau, you can actually pick the specs of what uh, materials you want in your assembly and send them to the service bureau or if you work in a company that has a model shop. That can be done right in SolidWorks. Okay. <clears throat> Another question here is revolving um, some of the recent changes in the materials, such as the Vero Clear and others. And this attendee is asking, what might we expect five years down the road with your materials? Ah, interesting. I wish I could speak uh, with, with the vision of five years. But um, I will tell you that Object invests heavily in R&D in the chemistry side of stuff. Um, we, you know, we talk about having 107 different materials available, and that's, that's leaps and bounds over our nearest competitor. But the, the truth of the matter is there's 4,000 ABS plastics out there that people use for their final products. So there's a huge upside for us to develop new materials, both as base materials and digital materials to, to try to better replicate the end plastics that people are trying to use. And so our goal is always to try to add to that portfolio of, of material offering. In terms of what they are and how, and, and how quickly they're going to come, which I can't, I can't speak to that. OK. Um, and another question is, is it possible to print in metal directly with object 3D printers? Uh, no. Uh, unfortunately, we are only printing rubber and plastic. There are technologies out there. I believe EOS is one of them that actually does print um, metals, but it's not something that's offered from object. OK. And this question is going to be for Dave. What do you feel is the biggest barrier to product development? Well, uh, resources. And, and that can come in the form of time to get your designs uh, conceived, uh, tested, uh, evaluated. Um, and objects, one of those tools that we use regularly. Uh, we got thousands of parts laying around where we have printed them and, and checked uh, our process. There's a lot of checks and balances along the way, and, and Object helps us to streamline that. Um, Leslie, can I ask a, a follow-on question to that of Dave? And I, and I haven't spoken to him about this, so I'm curious of how, how it's sure. worked. Um, Dave, what, can you talk a little bit about your experience of you know, time to market and how many prototypes you did before you owned a 3D printer and versus owning one today and how that's changed your development cycles? Has it sped it up? Do you do more prototypes? Do your designs change and whatnot? Again, we haven't spoken yeah, about it. Right, great question. Um, we used to go outside for uh, 3D uh, prototypes. Uh, so we would uh, you know, ship it off, email the, the design, and then we would get it back. And sometimes they would sand the parts and get them to the right finish that we were looking for. Because as you check form fit function, uh, if you have a really rough surface, it's tough to check your fit. So we were going outside. We were paying a lot of money, uh, you know, thousand, fifteen hundred bucks a, a print, and we're not talking a lot of parts. But we did that, and we realized the benefits, but it became uh, cost prohibitive. So that's where we started looking in house. Um, we do, on average, we'll probably print, I would say, you know, ten parts. Uh, a month, uh, it's kind of a, almost a minimum. So we do have a, a pretty good backlog, as I mentioned earlier, of projects and products. So we are uh, actively uh, printing every single project, uh, especially new product development. If it's a revision to existing products, sometimes we uh, forego that. But new product development, the whole new uh, line of communication to get people on board with what it is we're doing. Engineers have uh, a lot in their heads. And to get it out uh, in a simple way that, that you can communicate to everyone around you is, to an engineer, extremely important and beneficial, but also to those who you are communicating to, your audience. Um, just a, a, another follow-on question. Sorry, let's see if, if you don't mind me asking. But, no, that's OK. Um, did, did you guys use prototypes? You talked about the marketing and sales teams using them in the sales process. 
did they do it before when you actually outsourced, or is that something that was introduced after you guys brought 3D printing in-house? After we had the uh, printing in-house, uh, we, we would typically uh, modify our real products, uh, not the virtual ones, and it was expensive. We'd have to make custom valves. Now we can print uh, uh, this and give it to the salesman, a nice painted uh, product in a little miniature showcase. Uh, it works great for airports because you don't have to worry about the metal detector. <laughs> so it, it is kind of nice to be able to carry something that's lightweight, indicates your um, your points, and um, you know it doesn't it doesn't hold you back. But yeah, it was brought on after we had the technology. We would never go out and put the budget in to pay to have these things made and then uh, uh, and then paint it up and and then give them to the salesman. So right, I'm sure that's clever. Yeah, I'm sure that's helped shorten sales cycles for those guys. That we've talking to a lot of our customers who have said, without this, they weren't they they basically got locked out for a year in some cases of the sales cycle because they weren't able to communicate what they were offering. Well, just, to give, you, just to give you an idea, a little perspective, Bruce. Um, we uh, you know two years ago when we looked at investing in this equipment, uh, we saw about. You know, after everybody got the, over the initial wow factor, we started saying, "How can we use this?" You know, and uh, we saw within uh, probably about t uh, ten months, we started saying, "Okay, the sales guys want this. They want. They saw opportunities." And today, as a result, we have seen uh, like this Venturi. We have seen our sales um, skyrocket. Uh, when we look around the shop nowadays, it, it is loaded with these products. And we attribute that to the power of being able to communicate um, what is different, and people attach themselves to what they understand. Fantastic. Dave, a follow-on question is is coming in uh, for what you were just talking about. One person is asking, "Are you able to start a print at the end of the day and let it run overnight, or is this something that you need to watch as it runs?" Uh, great question. We uh, we do start uh, if it's something we look at. You know, we want to evaluate it by the end of the day. We'll start at the beginning of the day. Um, in some cases, you know, the time is usually based by how high the part is or, or the, the height of the part. Um, uh, but we will send it on a print cycle overnight uh, before we leave, and it has never had any kind of hiccups. It just is always, you know, come in the next morning and there are your parts. So it's uh it is nice to not have to sit there and babysit it. You just give it what it wants and tell it to go. Very simple. On average, what's the height of, of your products when you're prototyping? Uh, we're probably range? looking at yeah, it can be as thin as, you know, a quarter of an inch. Uh, up to probably uh, two inches. So and we so don't about, use the entire we don't use the entire envelope. So about how long do you think it takes then to do a print? About how many hours or minutes? You know, it's it can be a, a parts. You can lay several parts on there, but on the table. And if you build up something that's probably two inches high, two two and a half inches high. It could take eight hours. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's see. One of the other questions that's come in, this is back to you, Bruce. This is referring to, you mentioned SolidWorks. Do you also have software that's compatible with like Autodesk and AutoCAD and Inventor? We do have uh, the same plugin for AutoCAD as well as for PTC. Okay. And let's see. This question, this is a fun question, it always comes in. What's the cost of materials in cubic inches? Um, it is about $6 a cubic inch on average. And I'll, and I'll tell you why I'm using the word on average. Because as Dave referenced, there is support material and model material. And the support material is about half the cost of the model material. So if your design is 75% support material and 50, uh, I'm sorry, uh, a 25% model material, it'll be less expensive than the inverse. So on average, we say it's about $6 a cubic inch. 
and I'm not quite sure about this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway because it's a follow-on. What is the cost of refill for the printer materials? Okay, now I know what they mean. Or a cartridge itself. Yeah, so I think that's uh, what they're referring to, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, it's about $300 a kilogram for one cartridge. In, da in Dave's case, his particular printer uses a one kilogram cartridge, and it's about $300. It varies material by material, but on average, it's about three hundred dollars. Okay, Dave. Um, this person says you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to. But what surprised you the most after you received your three D printer? Something wonderful that you didn't expect? You know, uh, that's a great question. I, I, you know, probably one of the most important things is I started to notice how people around me got very excited. And I'll just give you a little personal testimony. You know, when the uh, everyone at Object had, had contacted me, you know, saying, hey, would you be interested in doing this webinar? I had, uh, I already had the enthusiasm in me. But when I went to, to look to the president of the company for his approval, um, he completely agreed. Hmm. And that's just a testimony to how much the people around me have been influenced by uh, the product and what it produces. It is a tremendous communication tool, uh, as I said before. And uh, to, to receive the, the support from my president was uh, one of the things I noticed just uh, in responding here, but also just how people are understanding what the, the engineering department is developing here at Griswold Controls. And that, that awareness, um, it buys, it gains them insight and it, and it gives them buy into the overall process. Okay. Uh, what was the most difficult thing about using the printer? You know, I don't have a most difficult thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, uh, probably, and I'll maybe I'll just make make this a little different. But uh, as Bruce was mentioning about material, one of the things that we did learn is that when you orient the parts, okay, to, um, to be inside the, the table, okay, the build volume as we call it. Um, the way you orient those parts determines how much of the support material you use. Um, the part material or the, the base material is, is always going to be the same, but the amount of uh, material you use and the, the length of time. If you take a part and stand it up on end, it's going to take way more time than it needs to, okay. Um, mm -hmm. But again, that wasn't a difficulty. That was just learning, you know, what to what to expect from the system. Um, and it's not a problem. It is. It, it's just a reality of sure. you have to kind of think through that. And, and it has an automatic placement feature, which we use. Um, you have all those degrees of freedom for rotating and manipulating the part to lay it on its side. So um, it's very accommodating. Okay, let me see here. This is, I guess, a clarification. Um, you mentioned that you have a two-inch high object. What is the base for that object? Is it two by two by two, or what are the what are the clarifying dimensions? Probably, I, I reference would be a, a part that is uh, about six inches by three inches by two two and a half inches high. Okay, Leslie, if I can clarify, our the model printer that Dave has has mm -hmm. an eight inch by twelve inch six inch build envelope, and we have yeah, the printers that yeah the actual print envelope itself. Dave's parts are different, but the print envelope is, is obviously larger. Yeah, the follow on right. question to that was how many of those objects can you print at one time? I think at this part I can do about four four or five um, unless you stack the parts up in your model, which you can you have the flexibility to to stack your parts in the model uh, and arrange them in an efficient uh, volume so that you can print more. Um, but just laying on the flat bottom surface, probably about four or five of, of the parts I just mentioned with the dimensions. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting question. Uh, this individual designs and donates assistance devices for disabled individuals, and he wants to know if there's a 3D printing material he should design with so that some of the parts could be used with these devices. He's looking primarily at strength issues. 
Interesting. I, I'm going to ask you to repeat that question, Liz, so I clearly understand. Okay. It. He designs uh, parts for um, disabled individuals, and he wants to know if there's a 3D printing material he should be looking into so that he so that some of those parts could be used in the devices that he's designing. So I guess he's looking for materials uh, with a, that have strength. That are, that are production strength. So yeah. objects, object um, positions all of our stuff really in the prototyping world. That's how we position as a company. I will tell you that we have lots of customers that use our ABS material in production ways, lots of tools, jigs, and fixtures. Um, and I know that there's others in, in Dave, I'm probably jumping the gun. You may have a circumstance where you've done that. There are others that actually do that, but we position all of our products really to be prototype uh, material at this point. Um, clearly, uh, you know, we do work with um, uh, organizations that make prosthetics and things along those lines, and sometimes they incorporate the rubber-like material. And, and again, um, their the tear strength and, and that type of stuff is probably not good enough for a production uh, material, but very good in the prototyping stage, and we get lots of uh, accolades from that area. Okay, Bruce, I can yeah. add. I can add to that. Uh, sure. We run into certain situations where, uh, for instance, if we're testing a product in the lab, uh, we will print right into the part, uh, you know, a tapered NPT uh, thread, so that we just, you know thread it to a piece of pipe and we can run water through it. But what we'll do is knowing the strengths, like ours is around 8,000 PSI, we plug that into SolidWorks, uh, we can actually add material and stiffen the design artificially so that we can accomplish our goal. But to Bruce's point on that, it, it is a prototyping material, so the designer has to consider the stress limits for the application and ultimately apply those accordingly. Okay, um, and Dave, there's a question here about post-processing time. Probably looking Great for question. averages. Yeah, um, it can be, it just depends on how many parts you're doing and how small they are. Uh, you know, if you use the print volume to print uh, hundreds of parts, little parts, um, you know, you, you're going to have to put those in a little high-pressure washer and individually, you know, spray each one of them. We tend to don't. I mean, we tend not to use the uh, the, pr the high production capability of, of maybe small parts, but uh, we might spend uh, like five minutes cleaning up a part at most because uh, it's it's fairly straightforward, um, very quick. Uh, it, it gets the job done, and you just dry off the part. And like I said, you can. There are some other solutions that object provides where you can kind of soak the parts and, and it'll do some further cleaning, but we find that that's um, not really necessary. Okay, a number of uh, the attendees have asked whether or not they're going to be getting a copy of this presentation, and based on your registration, you will be emailed a copy of this presentation, so that'll come to you in the next day or two. A couple of you have asked more specific questions about pricing for materials, and let me suggest that you uh, contact Bruce directly. The information is on your screen at the moment of where you can address your questions. That's the email address, and depending on your application, I'm sure Bruce can give you much more specific information or can direct you to, um, to that answer. Let me see, is there any questions that I missed? Um, there was one question about what kinds of uh, applications are best for some of these materials. Repeat that again. Sorry. What were what are some of the best um, industries or segments applications, especially as it regards to low volume production with new fabrication? You know, I, I wish I could tell you that there's a leading. Um, industry, you know, I, I do know that just based on the volume of material that we sell and where these machines go, that the consumer electronics and consumer goods are very, uh, we, we see sell a lot of printers into those areas. Um, you know, there is 
also medical applications, uh, dental applications that are kind of outside this discussion that we see a lot. And then obviously the industrial type of applications uh, that similar to what Griswold is doing are, are very popular. I wish I could actually tell you that there's a leading one, but the popularity and application use for 3D printers is so diverse now that it's, uh, it's being, being looked at in lots of industries and being leveraged in lots of different ways. Yeah, I don't think they've found an application that they can't use it for, really. Or, yeah. Um, here's, uh, this, this might be, though, the last question. Where do the materials populate in SolidWorks? Um, it it actually, it's, software? Yeah, it's, it's the plugin that we have. Um, to it's a plug-in from Object Studio. That's our software that plugs into into SolidWorks. So it's a it's a pop-up screen that pop, it, once you have it, its plug-in in SolidWorks, it will pop up in and and you just assign different material properties to your assembly. Uh -huh. That sounds like fun. All righty. Um, if I have not addressed your question, please feel free to email either Bruce or Dave. The information is located on your screen. You can also email me, and I'll make sure that the question gets to um, the proper person. But I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. And uh, I guess that'll be it, unless anybody has any final words. No, thanks so much, Leslie. We appreciate it. And Dave, once again, thanks a lot from Object's perspective on uh, sharing your information. It's been very uh, Likewise, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. And those of you who have has some questions that haven't been addressed, these will get to Bruce and, and Dave. So just FYI for that. All righty. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.